Being the workers and peasants' state, it's to be expected that work and the worker were at the centre of the GDR society. Despite paying 98% of Germany's reparations to the USSR and the region of eastern Germany itself being primarily rural before the war, the GDR rose from the ruins of World War II and built socialism as one of the leading industrial powers. This was down to the planned economy and the extent of the five-year plans that put Germans back on their feet and into work in record time with unprecedented workplace rights and economic freedom. Employment was a constitutional right. The concept of unemployment itself was alien to East Germans, and to quote Stalin, it is difficult for me to imagine what personal liberty is enjoyed by an unemployed person who goes about hungry and cannot find work. Having a job led to a sense of self-respect and empowerment. Gone were the queues of people waiting for the next bullshit job. The right to work also meant that it was almost impossible to be sacked, making workplace discipline hard to enforce like in Western countries and having a more liberationary atmosphere at work. Full employment and the mindset of the construction of socialism gave everyone a higher goal, a roof over their head and food in their belly. Something capitalism fails to do to this day, even in the biggest economies where there is extortionate wealth for the few and desperate poverty or subsistence for the many. 80% of all workers worked in a Volkseigene Betrieb, or a VEB, a system of workplaces that were owned by the people, but managed by the state. They served as centres of the community and of social life, and it's these that we'll focus on. The working day was eight hours long in the GDR, meaning that work was a significant part of people's lives. To ensure that parents, both male and female, could work and maintain a career, free childcare was provided to all families often with a creche on site or a school nearby, and summer camps for children during the holidays. By 1989, 1 1.3 million children had been to one of these camps at least once. Contrast this to the West, where women often suffer huge drawbacks in life to care for a child, as they cannot afford the extortionate fees for daycare. VEBs also had a health centre on site, with free health care to immediately deal with sickness or injury. Plus, if time was needed off work for sickness, wages were paid in full. There was never the threat of losing your job for an illness you couldn't control. There were often sport and leisure facilities as well, free of charge. Sport was central to the GDR, encouraging a healthy population, and to see this realised, there were no paywalls as we see under capitalism. Workplaces often had a gym, a swimming pool or a sports field, and larger factories would also have their own sports teams. These measures meant that the VEB became a hub of socialisation and not just a place of work. Education was also a priority as students often took day trips to factories, allowing worker and students to learn from one another and prepare the next generation for the world of work. Holiday homes were also owned by the VEBs at beaches or in the countryside so that workers could have cheap staycations. Of course, foreign travel was limited in the GDR and was one of the major complaints of East Germans, but these staycations served as small bits of comfort that could be relied upon year after year. Nowadays, it must be said, East Germans have the freedom to travel the world, but often lack the economic freedom to afford it, so they're confined to their own state. In short, the social hub formed around the VEB offers a glimpse at a form of work that's not alienating or exploitative, as we know under capitalism, but a form of work that is liberating and puts the worker before profit. Workers themselves also organised into social and working units called brigades. These were small teams that engaged in friendly competition to be the most productive. There were also opportunities to socialise and engage in culture, organising days out, theatre trips, bowling sessions, or just a casual drink after a hard day's work. There was also an important political role to these brigades, not only in the teaching of Marxism-Leninism, but also defending their rights from bureaucratic managers and pointing out poor conditions where they arose. For example, there's cases of brigades complain complaining about unbearable summer heat, and the next day the problem was solved by painting the windows and increasing ventilation. Workers also took an active role in the defence of socialism. The Kampfgruppen der Arbeiterklasse, or the fighting groups of the working class, traced their lineage back to the Communist Party's Red Front in the, in the 1930s, who fought bravely against Hitler's brown shirts on the streets. The Kampfgruppen boasted 200,000 members, more than the People's Army, and saw workers take up arms and learn military drill in their free time. 
Members were often the most class conscious of workers and believed firmly that the class struggle continued under socialism, with one militiaman stating, so long as there are still capitalist leeches and lords of the manor in the world, every worker has to have a rifle. Militiamen were not just for the armed defence of socialism, but also for its political defence. They formed reading groups and encouraged research into past workers' movements, revolutions, and as well as their own local history. The Kampfgruppen show us, as socialists today, that the role of the worker and the soldier can be fused, making a vital weapon in the defence of socialist achievements. Um, leading on for the last video, democracy did not end at the gates of the workplace in the GDR. In fact, it flourished, as workers had the dignity to stand up for their rights, unlike most in the West who live in fear of their boss. Workers had a direct say in the process of the drawing up of the five-year plans. The state drew up an, um, a, a draft for the plan, which was passed down to workplaces where discussions took place, amendments made, and sent back to the planning commission, who then edited the document, put it to the Volkskammer for a final vote of approval. This dispels the myth that the five-year plans involve state-mandated targets for workers, as they reported back what they and their brigade were actually capable of, yeah, based on their own productivity and objectives. Almost all workers were also members of the Free German Trade Union, or the FDGB. This often comes under fire as it was tied to the state and not independent, but the FDGB served a vital role in the maintenance of health and safety standards for the workers and could use its connections in the state to quickly resolve issues. In addition, it had its elective representatives in the Volkskammer who always put forward the views of the organised working class. The FDGB was also instrumental in the running of leisure activities and holiday homes. However, there were also other checks and, on work, checks and balances on workplace standards outside of state organisation. The workers in Peasants Inspectorate saw workers being directly elected to visit workplaces across the district and observe the running of the VEBs. They could also take disciplinary action against rogue managers who weren't adhering to the standards. Their objective being, quote, Fighting and eliminating bureaucracy, rose-tinted reporting, the falsifying of reports, the waste of public property, and misuse of public office. Their conclusions were then discussed in public meetings, and, su and suggestions for improvement were given. There were also the conflict commissions, which ran courts with 250,000 volunteers to settle workplace disputes. They could issue rehabilitative sentences for petty crimes, and as most were workers themselves, they often sided with the workers against the bureaucratic managers. This is almost the exact opposite of what we see in a capitalist society, with an institutional bias towards the bourgeoisie. These checks and balances, as well, uh, as, well as the immense difficulty to actually sack a worker, meant that a manager's powers were strictly limited. A final, but vitally important critique of the GDR is that workers had no constitutional right to strike. I personally believe this was an error, and of course this was raised many times during the constitutional debates of 1968, but this being said, strikes still occurred anyway, and they were not repressed. For example, there were 48 wildcat strikes in 1971, and 14 in 1981. So, they still happened. And, of course, they weren't shot at, unlike in, say, 1953. But we also have to bear in mind that the GDR learnt from 1953 and implemented the numerous legal channel, uh, channels that I've discussed earlier to avoid strike action, as an unresolved issue and a subsequent strike would have hampered socialist construction. Strikes were therefore the last resort and a sign that the numerous checks and balances had and could actually fail. But the number is also very low, we have to bear in mind, suggesting that, suggesting that disputes were often resolved long before the call for industrial action. Overall, the GDR offers a glimpse at what work might look like under a future socialist society. One where we aren't divided into individual bubbles and taught to screw each other over to get to the top. A workplace that allows us to socialise and better ourselves through sport and recreation, rather than grinding us down through long hours and pitiful wages. A vision of work that puts the working class firmly in the saddle, ensuring that the worker comes first, not profit or the boss. In a time where unemployment is skyrocketing and the cost of living is ever growing, the GDR stands out as a light for us, as an actually existing example of socialism where unemployment was banished to the history books and the worker could stand proud and look his manager in the eye as a fellow man. 
I'd like to thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And of course, do leave your comments and suggestions for the future. I'd just like to make a few little announcements. First of all, massive thank you for 1,000 subscribers. I've only been doing this for a month and I'm actually entirely blown away by the response to this series. Everyone seems to be really into it and I'm really enjoying talking about it, waffling away um, and hopefully educating people in my own little way about socialism. So thank you for that. Here's to many more, I guess. Also, I'd just like to do a little shout out for um, a Twitter account called The Honokarist. Um, he did my YouTube banner, which I'll now put up here. Beautiful uh, banner with Lenin, Connolly and Honaker. Um, I really like it. It's incredible. It's plastered everywhere. Um, he's actually doing commissions for banners. So if you want one like this or like a little bit of art or something, go over, toss him a couple of quid and he'll, he'll do one up for you. Um, or at least just go over and give him a follow anyway, because he is a highly based comrade. As for what's next, um, it will be a video about equality in the GDR, looking at gender, sexuality and the international solidarity with the colonised peoples of the world. That being said, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed and I'll catch you in the next one.